Just had to do that one more time today. I'm sorry. I just kind of been running through my head all day long and all night. Last night, I woke up uh, very early this morning, rather startling, and that came to mind real quickly. So uh, it is good to be with you all this evening, and I pray that you have a great day. It's been a busy, busy, busy day today, but such a good and wonderful day. Uh, Please continue to pray. I pray that I get (coughs) through this evening (coughs) with a voice. Who knows what's going to happen, but uh, I'm sure glad I'm with you tonight. You guys are such a blessing. Um, i let you know, we, the question was brought up yesterday at the Seekersburg. It was about a memorial for Buddy. 
And for those of you that know him, or those of you that have been familiar with him from the broadcasts and stuff, uh, that probably won't be until the end of November or the first of December. So uh, keep that in your uh, uh, keep the family in your prayers as all that's being put together. Julia told me that there's uh, weeks, even even a couple of months out, in the transport of a body from one state to another. So uh, that's part of the holdup. The other part is things going on in the family that they don't want, uh, you know, uh, uh, the funeral to be the defining moment for the rest of uh, some young people's lives and stuff like that. But at any rate, we are here this evening. It's good to see you, Pastor Luciano. Very first one. Ah, that means that the Philippines beat us all this evening, folks. And they are here. Brother, it's good to see you this evening. I've uh, been praying for you this morning. Uh, you're a great brother. I love you. Praying for what, what what God's doing there. I shared with everybody this morning. I had uh, talked with Pastor Sadich, and we sent some uh, uh, resources to him. Uh, we'll be getting a picture of the rice and stuff for the orphanage. And it's a blessing that God has blessed us with. And we are able to bless. We get a, the privilege and the blessing of joining and partnering with Pastor Luciano as they want to expand that ministry this Christmas time. Hopefully reach many more families. And I hope we can be a very significant part of that just in being a support to you, brother. We love you. And Miss Donna is there this evening. Good evening, Miss Donna. Love you. Rick, Lena, God bless you. Love to see you. Thank you for the good word that you shared the other day. Thank you for the encouragement. And the Jensens are here. Buck, good evening. Janice, good evening. Great couple, folks. Great couple. And of course, you all know that, uh, that know them. And everybody give that three I love yous out there to Miss Terry. It's good to see her up there this evening. And Sherry says, good evening, dear brothers and sisters. Pastor Luciano, it is so wonderful to see you. We are all praying for you and your family and your beloved church family. Yes, 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 we are. I shared your Christmas video from 2021 Sunday morning. Uh, you know, for folks to see. So, uh, at any rate, as we get ready, we're going to stick around uh, tonight, probably finish it up this evening. Who knows what time we'll have. In Isaiah 26, uh, we had two verses, one, uh, two, a couple in, in Isaiah 25 we looked at for a couple of weeks, and here in Isaiah 26, verses 19 through 21. You're very welcome, my brother. And, uh, you know, I want to, uh, I want to share with you why... Uh, I believe, at least, you know, and I may be, Miss Jessica, hello, 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 big hug and kisses to our sweet little Sadie out there. Uh, if you hear me, Sadie, I love you. Wave your hands, kick your feet, give me a hi, say a, a hearty amen, give me a squeal, sing with me, all right? At any rate, uh, there are those who probably don't see it the way I do, but when I look at uh, Isaiah 26, verses 19 through 21, this messianic psalm that we've looked at, I, uh, I, see, uh, I, I see the beautiful picture of, uh, of, of the resurrection and of the rapture in particular, and I want to share with you tonight four reasons why I believe this passage refers to the rapture. All the way here in the Old Testament, it gives us a picture, a foreshadowing out there, if you will, of uh, this incredible, tremendous event that we are yet waiting for. So take a look at it with you, me, with you. If, if you la, 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 la. take a look at Isaiah 26, verses 19 through 21. Listen to this. Your dead will live. Their corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust awake and shout for joy, for your dew is as the dew of dawn, and the earth will give birth to the departed spirits. Uh, if you've got a King James or a New King James, I've looked it up. I don't think it's the greatest translation, but ears might read, uh, the dead will live, and uh, uh, I, I will rise. My body will rise. Uh, uh, puts it in the, in the singular, in the first person, giving the uh, indication that the, the speaker or who is speaking about this God is saying you know, that he will rise, which for them, really, if, if you take that, further ties it in, uh, I believe, to the resurrection and to the rapture. But at any rate, look at verse 20. 
It says, come my people, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until indignation runs its course. For behold, the Lord is about to come out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth from, for their iniquity, and the earth will reveal her bloodshed and will no longer cover her slain. Now, as I read these verses, uh, the first thing uh, that shoots into my mind is that how this passage really seems to fit perfectly with other verses in the Bible that talk about the upcoming, and I believe imminent event, uh, that Christians uh, commonly referred to. It's not, you know, you won't find the word rapture in the Bible. Uh, you won't. It is a term that, that describes the gathering together, the, the, the plucking out uh, that other scriptures speak of. Now, many Bible commentaries don't interpret Isaiah 26 and verses 19 through 21 this way. Uh, some instead apply it to God's last plague before uh, uh, the Jewish exodus. And some others uh, apply it to uh, uh, you know, God's uh, judgment uh, in, of, of, of other nations. So, you know, as, as they've come against Israel. Uh, but, in fact, I don't see many rapture-believing Christians when they're talking about the rapture, refer to this verse in their teaching. So I decided to provide reasons why I believe this passage clearly refers you know, to the rapture. Incidentally, uh, if you have uh, Dr. Henry uh, Morris's uh, commentaries or David uh, Guzik, uh, they're among just a few, uh, or at least not just a few, but but you know those who include this verse as an Old Testament reference uh, to the rapture. At any rate, after prayer, we'll examine this passage just a little more uh, closely. So if you have a prayer request, pop it up there, please. We've tried to keep everything before you. met with Mike today, uh, Elliot, and uh, he is doing well. Folks, the pain of the uh, uh, a rehab that he goes through, all the exercises he have to do, and then the rehab when he goes into rehab on that shoulder because of the rebuild they had to do. The tendon that laps over the shoulder and ties in up here had slipped all the way down, you know, underneath the scapula. So they had to take, stretch that out, pull it out, and tie it back in place. So you can imagine how uncomfortable all of that might be but we had a great time wonderful visit uh, just a neat young guy uh, but uh, keep praying for him he needs your prayer he needs your encouragement he needs your support during this time i've mentioned julia keep her you know and the family in prayer during this time uh, though they rejoice in the fact that buddy is home there's still that physical loss uh, uh, pray here in a couple of weeks. Roger will be baptized, so we want you to be praying, you know, for him. A great time. Uh, Janice says, pray for Jolene. Thank you. She was next on my list. Appreciate that, Janice. Jolene is still recuperating. Uh, was over to see her the other day and dropped some food off and seemed to be doing pretty well. Kind of overdid things on Sunday, she said, but uh, is doing pretty well. Much better than I think I'd do if they removed one of my kidneys, but uh, uh, she looked good and uh, she was moving around really good. So, But keep her, keep her much in your prayers, as well as Miss Terry up there, because she's still got quite a long recuperative period going as that, uh, as that break above the angle uh, heals. But it's good to see her on her scooter getting around everywhere. She was at the breakfast yesterday, too. So uh, her knee scooter, I, I like that. Uh, at any rate, we're going to go now to a mission video to look at the White family. You met them here a couple of weeks ago. They took you on a little trip up into the hills in Guatemala, and you met a family and some of the work that is done up there. Uh, well, we're going to take a couple of weeks with this family. Uh, it's one of the uh, v VBS videos from some time ago, well, just a couple of years ago, actually, during this whole COVID thing. So I think you'll enjoy you know, what you get to see. I've learned some stuff that I didn't know, and it's uh, been quite enjoyable. But at any rate, I'm going to remove this, all right? And here comes our mission video, folks.
Guatemala is known for its Mayan culture. The Mayans designed and built many cities. Each had a huge central plaza. The plaza was ringed with temples, pyramids, a ball court, and a palace for the city ruler. You might think they would have a hard time building huge temples and cities and miles of roadway through the jungles and swamps of Central America, especially using tools made of stone, wood, and seashells. But the Mayans were such great designers and builders that the ruins of their cities built over a thousand years ago remain today throughout Central America. But God is the ultimate designer and God has uniquely designed all of us for His purpose. He has a plan for every one of us, a perfect plan. Me and my family are here as missionaries because God, the designer, has called us here to tell people about Jesus. There are over 20 Mayan people groups living here in Guatemala. We have worked with the Kekchi and Chorti. Each Mayan people group has its own dress. You can often tell where an indigenous person is from based on their clothing. There are around 23 different languages spoken in Guatemala. Spanish is the official language, but each Mayan group has their own language. It is important for missionaries to learn the language of the people group they are targeting. Hearing the gospel in your heart language is very important. Cacao, which is Spanish for chocolate, is grown in Guatemala and is part of Mayan culture. You can visit a local shop to learn about it and do a chocolate making class. Guatemala's main exports are coffee, sugar, fruits, and a lot of the bananas you eat in the U.S. are probably from Guatemala. But everyone's favorite Guatemala export is chocolate. Chocolate, muy bueno! In the Bible, we learn that not many people thought David would be a good king or even considered him at all, but God did. He saw his heart and God prepared David to be the king. The Bible says, humans do not see what the Lord sees, for humans see what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. God is the ultimate designer. Just like he prepared David to be a king, God uniquely designed us for his purpose. Meeting someone in Guatemala and seeing their heart open up to knowing more about Jesus is so sweet, even sweeter than chocolate. Let's see if I got that down right. Chocolate muy bueno. I like that. I think I could remember that. I think I could say that if I got to Guatemala or any place else where Spanish is chocolate muy bueno. I need to remember when I see Rosa, I may just tell her chocolate muy bueno. All right, I kind of like that. All right, I know. It's the end of a long day, folks. It really is. So bear with me. Listen, I have fun. All right. I think we ought to have fun, and I enjoy this. Miss Donna says, talk to my brother Mike, and they put him on steroids to help with the pain. He has a ruptured disc in his back. Ouch. Wow. I need to call my brother because they did his uh, others. They have, they have decided to handle the pain in his back. They are killing the nerves in the low back. They uh, did laser treatment on one side last week, and they were to do laser treatment on the other side, today so i'll wait and call him tomorrow and see how that's going and see how he's doing so keep him on your prayer list as well i'd really appreciate it and mike keep mike on his your prayer list as uh, he try they try to heal up this ruptured disc in his back any other prayer requests get them out there all right so let's uh, let's pray and then we're going to jump into our bible study all right <coughs> Father, thank you for the moments and the opportunities that we have to come together to unite and, 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 and be one in, in the moment, whether it's in the studying of the Word of God or it's in prayer. We thank you, Lord, that we are linked and joined together by the Spirit of God. Whether we're in the same room or uh, we're in the same broadcast, 
it is the same God that we serve. I'm still trying to get my head around, Lord, the uh, the technology that, that we have that opens up in a way that I never even consciously kept in my mind uh, the very doors of the world to us and to bring the gospel. I thank you, Father, for that. And I, I thank you, Lord, for, for the email that I got. I had to translate it, Lord, because it was in a different language, but uh, uh, from somebody who has been listening and uh, got a friend that has been interpreting the forum, Lord, uh, in Germany. That's a blessing. Lord, that there's a, a soldier there that is interpreting to, uh, you know, some, some people there in Germany that don't speak English, these Bible studies. God, I, I, I thank you for that. I kind of get overwhelmed when I think of those kind of things that are happening. I don't understand them. But I know that you are God, that you are sovereign, and I don't know why you would choose to release the things that I share, Lord, out because there's so many more <laughs> eloquent people that can speak your word more boldly than me. But I thank you, and it humbles me. I thank you for friends like Pastor Luciano, though we've never physically met and in the same place, we have become brothers. We share the same heart and same desire, as well as this young man, Lord, this this young pastor, Pastor Sadiq in India, uh, Lord, just uh, young and, and Lord, just just wants to be what you want him to be, wants to carry that message, Lord, to people who haven't heard. That passion, that drive that Pastor Luciano has to, to get out there into areas and take your word. Thank you that we can partner. Thank you that we can be a part. Thank you that we can get to know each other and pray for one another. Thank you that our churches can pray for one another. Lord, I pray that as you open doors of the gospel to them and giving them souls, that you'll open the door to the gospel for us and give us souls as you do for Pastor Sadiq. God, may you be blessed and honored. I think of those that we pray for, Lord. I, I think of those that are grieving and going through hard times, like like Julia. She's moving now, has to get out rapidly from where she lives and uh, at the same time make arrangements for Buddy. But, Lord, there are those who uh, are recuperating from, from uh, injuries or illnesses like uh, Jolene or, or, or Terry, and we lift them up, Mike, we entrust them to you. Pray, Lord, that you'll make their recuperative period and their strengthening period one of a blessing and give them a, a great testimony, giving you glory, even when things are hard, that they learn to give you glory. For uh, Donna's brother, for, for Michael, as they seek to, to, to heal this ruptured disc in his back, God, you be with him. Lord, we just love you. We, we thank you. We come. Knowing, Lord, that, that you have all things in your care. I think of Roger, Lord, as he uh, witnesses and testifies through his baptism. May, may, Lord, the power of the Spirit of God move upon that service here in a couple of weeks. And God, you just bless. Lord, I can think of those who are lost that have been coming to service. That so desperately need a relationship with you. God, open their heart, open their, their mind, open the heart that they would receive your word, Lord. Father, they would turn and they would repent and they would surrender themselves up to you. God, I ask you that we be faithful, constantly, constantly faithful, Lord, to present your word, your gospel to any and all that will hear. Now bless us as we go into your word, Lord, tonight. And I pray, Lord, that you will teach us, draw us into wisdom and truth and open up our understanding and excite our very spirits, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. And I do. I do hope, <laughs> really, really do hope, that when you guys go to the Word, that uh, that it's something that just uh, brings a spark, makes, makes everything alive. Uh, Terry says, I can identify with Michael handling this scooter is causing my shoulder to hurt. Okay. I bet it does, leaning over and doing that. But it sure has given you mobility, my friend. Uh, 
and she is just about the sweetest, isn't she, folks? All right. Well, let's talk about get the, you know, see how far we get tonight in looking at four reasons why this passage here in Isaiah 26 speaks of that incredible uh, uh, event that we're still waiting for, the rapture. Uh, let me put the outline up there so that you have it. First one I want to see, first reason is uh, that little phrase, your dead will live, your corpses will rise. Concerning that little phrase, Dr. Henry Morris uh, of the Defender's Bible Study, he states this, here is an Old Testament assurance of the bodily resurrection of the believing dead. An assurance being possible because God himself in Christ would be the conqueror of death. Is that not right? In Isaiah 20, look at that again. It says, your dead will live, your corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy. Let me ask you a question. When will those who lie in the dust arise and shout for joy? You say, at the resurrection, okay? Can I ask you when that's going to be? For the vast majority of believers, when will the resurrection happen? Well, we know that there's going to come a day that the heavens will roll back and there'll be the sound of a trumpet and the voice of the archangel. And those who are dead in Christ will rise. We'll look at that a little bit later. And those of us that remain that are still alive, that have not fallen asleep in Christ, we will be joined with them, and we will rise also. We will be joined with the Lord, evermore to be with him. So when will the dead live? When will the corpses rise? When will those who lie in the dust awake and shout for joy? Well, I believe also this is a literal fulfillment that we see of something that happened in the time of Christ. In Matthew 27, and Matthew is the only one that references this. He's the only gospel that, that mentions it. In Matthew 25, or 27, verses 51 through 53, it says, behold, And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook. And the rock split. So this great earthquake takes place. And the rock split. And the tombs were open. Okay, the stones that sealed up the tombs, they fell from the opening of the tombs. And many bodies, doesn't say all, does it? It says many of the bodies of the saints, and that word refers to those God-fearers, those God-fearing, uh, Messiah-believing Old Testament saints who had fallen asleep, were raised. Coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Wow. I, you know, quite honestly, I've never preached on this. And, and maybe I've only taught on it you know, once or twice, but it's an incredible sight. It's one of those things that happened at the death of Christ. Now we know uh, that, that when Christ died upon the cross, you know, at the moment that he died, that, that the veil was rent, it's finished. And God tore that veil as thick as a man's hand, ripped it like a sheet of paper from top to bottom, exposing the holy of holy. How would you have liked to have been a priest in the holy place at that particular time? trying to hang on to something as the earth was shaking around you, and all of a sudden you hear this, this ear-shattering rip, and you look up, and this linen veil that is, 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 like I said, it was as wide as a man's head, is torn from top to bottom. And you know anybody that went into the Holy Holies, except for the high priest one time a year. I mean, they were toast, folks. Can you imagine what he was thinking? Of course, by that time, God had vacated the Holy Holies. It wasn't the same, but you, you do understand what I'm saying. The belief was there. And at that time, these tombs began to, to just fly open. Now, apparently, now this is the biggest mystery to me. 
in, in all of it because I, I don't have a problem believing in the rapture or believing in the resurrection or any of this. But, but the mystery is to me, look at what it says. It says, the tombs were opened and many of the dead bodies of the saints who fall asleep were raised. But look at the very next verse. And coming out of the tombs, when did they come out of the tombs? After his resurrection, and then they entered into the holy city and appeared to many. I wonder, and this is my imagination, so go with me with this, if you will, for a minute. I wonder what they did on Friday night and Saturday, sitting in the tomb, alive, but still in the tomb, awaiting the resurrection of Christ to come out. Have you ever thought about that? That struck me today as I was praying through the text and I'm looking at this and praying through the lesson. I'm thinking, wow, my, my, now my imagination goes in a lot of different directions. You know, I, I know they didn't have a cribbage set. I know they didn't have a chess set. They didn't have a TV to watch or anything. I wonder what went on. Maybe that's one of those mysteries that'll open. In fact, I'm sure it is. That'll open up to us when we know even as we're known. But the raising of the saints, these God-fearing Old Testament believers, relates directly to the coming of the kingdom. Who were these saints? Have you ever asked that question? Now, I got to tell you, there's a lot of debate. I've tried to find as much material on this as I could, and it would appear that uh, these were people who were recognizable to others as those who were God-fearing, Messiah-believing, who had died and was buried, only be raised upon the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, I am of the opinion that it wasn't saints like uh, you know, like Joshua or 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 any of them. I, I'm of that opinion simply because they would have been you know dust by that. Maybe that doesn't mean anything, but I get the sense at which that these are tombs that were in around you know Jerusalem itself. I don't think they came from far away like Daniel you know, being raised up and coming from uh, his burial place in, in Babylon or anything like that. So I, I, I have a, a sense like Lazarus who had risen before the death of Christ at the voice of Jesus that these were people that they would have recognized were God-fearing, Messiah-believing saints now, I know there's a lot of debate about it. But you see, these are the ones who have died and, and buried. And I think people recognize it. Raising of a few, as I said, not all. Remember what it says. Uh, behold, the temple was torn in two. At the bottom, earth shook and said the tombs opened up. And many bodies, not all, many bodies. Raising of a few shows that Jesus has the power to resurrect but also points forward to the second coming and the judgment of Jesus Christ, which will include all those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, who are there by faith in the grace of God, knowing that Jesus has died and conquered death through his resurrection, ought to hasten our desire to repent and to trust him alone for salvation so that we too can one day be resurrected in the twinkling of an eye. For those of you that are listening and you've not made a decision to follow Christ, I would tell you, if there's anything that would, would I, I would pray, would, in, would, would inspire you, would draw you with a hunger to accept Christ, it is this fact that death isn't the final answer. To, to, to shuffle off this mortal coil, to, to die in this physical life. Uh, the body will go back to where it was, back to dust, but I'll be united with Christ forever. And one day, I'll be given a new, imperishable, immortal, incorruptible body, glorified like the body of my Lord. I don't know what it will be like, as John says, but I know it will be like him. Now, this act in Matthew is a foreshadowing of that very coming event. 
an event that will be completed when Christ returns and all that in the graves shall come forth. Remember the prediction Jesus made when he had to say in John 5, 28 and 29? Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did good deeds to the resurrection of life. Now what is that work? What is that hard, good work? Doesn't he say, this is the work of the Father, believe in me? Those who committed the evil deeds to the resurrection of judgment. So not only does the resurrection point to, to, to the blessing of, of, of the resurrection that comes to those that believe, but it also points uh, to the resurrection of those who will be raised to judgment. Remember Daniel? Daniel 11 and 12, Daniel says that there's two resurrections there. There's the resurrection of those to blessing and those to judgment. In the progression of events which comprise the rapture, the first thing that occurs is the bodily resurrection of the saints called the dead in Christ. And also called, as Paul does, they that are Christ's. In other words, his possession. You know the verses in 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 and 15? For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now that's just a euphemism. Paul doesn't refer to death in, in, with, with a tone of finality. He calls death nothing more than a, uh, than a sleep. You go to sleep, you're going to wake up again. That body is asleep in the grave or in the tomb, but it's going to live again. It's going to wake up. It's going to wake up and arise from the dust, as Isaiah says. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ those who are in him will rise first. They got the jump on us. Those graves are going to split open. And every saint in those graves are going to come up out of that grave with new glorified bodies. And we will be joined with them and, and, and immediately we'll shuffle off this and 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 this which is the physical corruptible body will be instantly changed into the imperishable and immortal what an incredible scene that's going to be you know we see the movies like left behind and stuff like that and we, we 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 see you know the the, the hollywood uh, uh you know uh, techniques that they use to describe it but it'll be nothing like that I don't know that our minds can get around it. If you can think, and, and, and the horror of being on an airplane at that time, but if you can think of sitting next to somebody or carrying on a conversation with them, and all of a sudden they're just not there, that's the close. It would, think about it. Unbelievable. I was reading an article where there's been preachers that have been sued over the last several years on teaching and preaching on the resurrection. You believe that? It's called spiritual tyranny. Spiritual terrorism. Because somebody has decided that they had the nightmare because somebody talked on the, on the rapture and they were afraid they were going to leave a bit left behind and they had to go to a psychiatrist and all this and they ended up suing parents and suing the church. for your terrorist activity. So folks, I'm talking to you and preaching to you about the resurrection, about the rapture. It's going to happen. Christ is coming back, and as he comes back, his first act in coming back is to gather together the saints of God, dead and living, he is going to remove the church from this world. 
and the influential power of the church to retard evil and push back corruption, 2 Thessalonians, it will happen. I believe it's the next thing to happen on God's prophetic calendar. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says that there is an order to the resurrection. First Christ rose as the first fruits of the resurrection, and then all those who belong to him will be raised after that. This is the first piece of evidence which gives me a clue to the fact that these verses in Isaiah 26 are indeed speaking of the rapture. Since this is also a messianic prophecy, I'd like to point out to all of my unbelieving Jewish friends, and I have many out there, and some listen, so I speak to you as my, my friends listen. This verse refutes, I think, completely the common, and I believe erroneous belief and rabbinic interpretation of Isaiah 53, suffering servant, as being the nation of Israel instead of Yeshua, the Messiah. So the first reason, the first reason I give you is this, your dead will live. Their corpses will arise. You who lie in the dust, awake! And shout for joy. Now the second reason, which is where we have to pick up next week, but is that phrase, come my people, enter into your rooms and close your doors behind me. Boy, does that sound like a mysterious, mysterious command. I think when we unfold it next week, you'll find it less mysterious and more awe-inspiring. I pray you're seeing this. And I pray it's as uh, encouraging to you as it is to me as I was putting the lesson together. I've kind of worked on this for the last few weeks because it's just, to me, exciting to see God and see how even back here, where I have people tell me, oh, the Old Testament, that's the, that doesn't relevant to us. We're out here in the new. But oh, what do we see this? We ought to be jumping for joy. May God bless you. May God bless you abundantly. Father, I thank you so much for our time together tonight. Just to take these truths that mean so much to us as believers and just put them out for us. To, to, to literally dive into them and swim around into them and enjoy them. Be immersed in them. And then Lord allow you to immerse us, them in us. God, I pray that we will rest this evening with the with a vision of your return in our, our, our minds. With the glory of the rapture upon our heart. And anticipation that any day now our Lord could return. To you be glory, praise, honor in all things, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Pray, if you will, please pray for this Sunday. We're going to be looking at the divine certainty out of Romans chapter 9, moving on from there, about verses 24 through 26. Uh, so be in prayer as we look at divine certainty. Oh, folks, there's nothing like being certain. It's kind of like looking at this. There's a divine certainty in this. There's a promise that God says this is going to happen. And what a joy, absolute joy that brings to our soul. And it should give us the, uh, uh, the drive to carry this word, even to the ends of the earth. My brother, Pastor Luciano, love you. We're praying for you. May God bless your coming, Lord's Day. May God bless you with souls and lives. May he do that for us and for Pastor Sadich. Pray for those children in the orphanage, unwanted, cast off, 
children being taken in and nurtured by the church. May God bless. I love you all. What a great day. May God bless your evening. See you tomorrow morning at 9.